In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. There is no greater love than this, that someone should lay down his life for his friends. This morning, we gather here to reflect, to remember, and to pray for those who laid down their lives for their friends and for us today. The Great War was so long ago that no one now alive remembers it. What we do remember is how the war to end all wars paved the way for a full century of conflicts, deaths, even genocide. And we remember parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles for whom the war was not history, but a reality that accompanied them each day, taking sons and husbands, brothers, daughters, sisters, friends, who never came home. While none of us has personal memory of World War I, we do have the extraordinary gift of letters. Letters which speak to us across a century describing both the horrors and the humanity in the trenches. This morning, I'd like to share a few so that the feelings, the fears, and the hopes live on in our hearts, in our imaginations, even as the authors and their generation now live forever in eternity. In our first reading from Wisdom, we heard, in the hour of their judgment, they will shine in glory and will sweep over the world like sparks through stubble. May 12th, 1915, France. My dear mother, have just come through a particularly nasty period. We went into the trenches on Wednesday night, and on Sunday morning at 5 a.m., our artillery commenced bombarding the German trenches and after 20 minutes had elapsed, we went over the parapet. My goodness, what a reception they had in store for us. They simply swept the ground with machine gun fire and shrapnel. It was found impossible to make any advance in our quarter, so I dug myself in and awaited events. It was horrible suspense as I seemed to be the only man untouched. All around me, and being personally acquainted with each man, made matters worse. In fact, it's all wrong to call them men, as they were mostly boys. As regards the gas masks, all we were served out with were made on the spot and consisted of a piece of gauze and tape and were steeped in a solution of bicarbonate of soda prior to this charge. I lost all my belongings except the Gillette razor, so should be glad of a few toilet requisites when next you are sending a parcel. Much love to all, your affectionate son, Dick. August 6th, 1915, at sea en route to the Dardanelles in Turkey. Dear Nick, first of all, I must thank you and the others who sent kind letters of sympathy in regard to my brother Sam. We all felt it very much at home, and it was a great shock to our parents naturally, but it can't be helped, as he was killed in a good cause. I suppose you have heard how we left Bedford early on Sunday 
July 18th. The first part of the voyage, the sea was very quiet. We passed Gibraltar in a fog at night, so couldn't see it, then skirted the coast of Algeria and had a pleasant run to Malta. The sea is fairly rough at this end, rather surprising, but a lovely color, light blue at day and dark at night. Our kits have been left behind in Egypt and all we have got, we stand in. We are now passing through the Aegean Sea full of rocky islands, very much like the highlands of Scotland. I am in the best of health at present and hope to go through all right. I expect you heard I got married a week before I left. A lot of us did the same thing. It was quite a common occurrence. I have been away nearly a year. I shall be glad to hear from you now and again, just to keep touch. Yours sincerely, George Shipley. He was killed December 2nd, 1915. April 6th, 1916, France. Thanks very much for your letter, which I received a week or two ago, also for the magazine. We are in the trenches just now. In fact, we seem to spend about three times as much time in as we do out. It was about here that the French and German had some of the fiercest fighting of the war. The country around about is a veritable maze of trenches. The fighting at one time was so fierce that there was only time just to bury the dead in the sides of the trenches. And now that the trenches have crumpled, one is constantly seeing the bones of men's legs or their boots or skulls sticking out from the sides of the trenches. All times the air is thick with bombs, grenades, and trench mortars. These last are pretty hellish sort of toys. They have an explosion like around 10 earthquakes rolled into one. But even these are not the worst we have to put up with. The trenches being so close together, there is of course any amount of mining going on. So no one ever knows when the particular lump of earth one is standing on is going to take a trip through the solar regions. Five exploded in this neighborhood, while others are expected to go up at any time. How is everything in town? Pretty quiet, I suppose. That's about all the news, so we'll close. Kindest regards to everybody, Gilbert Williams. From 1914 to 1918, between nine and 11 military personnel were killed. The US, which entered the war only in 1917, suffered about 116,000 military deaths, while across the British Empire, as many as 1.2 million people died. France, lost 1.4 million soldiers and 300,000 civilians, nearly 4.5% of their population. All told, 19 million people died in World War I. That overall number pales in comparison to the 85 million in World War II, but for France and Belgium, the United Kingdom and Canada, the Great War was far more deadly. And then, after four years of fighting, the armistice was signed. 
the guns, the bombs, and the poison gas stopped, leaving in their wake incalculable loss, waste, and buried beneath fields of blood-red poppies or sons who never came home. Others did, but lost limbs, and in some cases, their minds. Many found fellowship in the trenches, only to have those friends taken in a flash. Those here this morning who have served in subsequent wars will have a far deeper sense than I of both the horrors as well as the grace and love manifest in trenches and in battlefields. Today, we are not so naive as to think that any war, however terrible, will end all wars. History has taught us that one generation's hard-fought peace is another's folly, easily swept aside. It was on November 10th, 1938, one day shy of the 20th anniversary of the armistice, that came Kristallnacht, when Jewish homes and businesses and synagogues were looted or destroyed in Germany. 1,500 people were killed that night, 30,000 sent to concentration camps, the start of another war. One we understand perhaps more profoundly, followed by yet more in Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. So where is the good news? Where do we find God in these stories, in these real life experiences of war, of death and loss? Well, ironically, in the trenches. We find God in the trenches, in the men who cared for and protected each other. In the 1914 Christmas ceasefire, when British and French soldiers shared gifts and sang carols and played games with Germans for that one holy night, proving that war was rooted in governments not in the men who would otherwise have been friends. And now a generation later, or in a generation later rather, we find good news, God, in the liberators who freed the few survivors who were left to die in concentration camps. And now in the last months, we find good news, we find God in the brave soldiers who took bullets and grenade blasts while refugees fled for safety from the Taliban. We experience good news and we experience God every time hate and mistrust are overcome with friendship and understanding. I'd like to close with one last letter from the front. This one penned by a Canadian chaplain, Father Lockerley, and it was dated September 25th, 1916. He writes, by the time this letter reaches you, you will no doubt have received official notice of your son's death. 
I read the burial services at the grave this morning, and he had a lovely funeral. The band of the 2nd Battalion, accompanied by a large body of soldiers and officers, marched to the grave, where after the service was read, the last post was sounded. Last Saturday afternoon, your son asked me if I would hear his confession, and Sunday morning he went to communion. He entered the trenches Sunday night and was killed Friday night. Your son, I am told, met his death by going over the parapet and rescuing a wounded soldier. On his return with the wounded soldier, a sniper caught him with a bullet, and he died without suffering. Greater love than this hath no man, that a man lay down his life for a friend. Captain McGuire died in making the supreme act of charity. And so, they shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. In wisdom we read, in the hour of their judgment, they will shine in glory and will sweep over the world like sparks through stubble. And Jesus said, this is my commandment, love one another as I have loved you. There is no greater love than this, that someone should lay down his life for his friends. May we find it so. To God be the glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.